So this month I am celebrating 10 years fully self-employed, which is super exciting. Uh, I've been running my head and my business for 12 years. And so I thought what I would do today was share with you 10 things I wish I'd known when I started my own handmade business 12 years ago, which I then went full time in in 2010. If you don't know who I am, my name is Jess Van Den and I run a jewelry business called Ethereal. And as I said, I started that in 2008 as a hobby business and went full time with it in 2010. I've been running it ever since. I also employ my husband and I also run Create and Thrive where I share videos, podcasts, courses and my membership community, The Thriver Circle. And my aim with all of that is to help other makers like myself make that transition and work out how to take your handmade hobby and turn it into a thriving and profitable business. Okay, the first thing I wish I had known when I started is that it does get easier after the first few years. So the first couple of years are the hardest part and the hardest time uh, running a handmade business because you are figuring out your product line, you're figuring out how to sell, you're working out how to market, you're doing a lot of education, a lot of learning, a lot of experimenting, a lot of failing, which is not only normal but necessary. And it just is a lot of work in the first few years to get everything off the ground. It's like starting anything new. You know, you have to learn about it in the beginning as well as learn how to do it. And it takes time to build skills and it takes time to build mastery. But once you've been doing it for a couple of years, not only have you learned a lot, you've got systems in place which makes things more streamlined and everything's a bit faster and it gets easier. That's not to say it ever gets like so simple you don't need to think about it anymore because you always want to be learning and developing and keeping up with things as they change. But if you are in those first few years, rest assured, it definitely gets easier and it's, you know, it'll take you less time to work on the business side of things further down the track. Okay, the second thing I wish I'd known before I started or just when I started my handmade business was that you need a niche and even more specifically, a micro niche. Why does this matter? Basically because you want to be known as the person who makes X, Y, Z, one, two, three. You don't want to just be like, oh, I make jewelry. Oh, oh, I make candles. Oh, I make clothes. Tell us a little bit more. Become more specific. So a niche would be, I make sterling silver jewelry, as do hundreds of thousands of other people in the world. Even smaller, I make recycled sterling silver jewelry. Even smaller than that, I make minimalist recycled sterling silver jewelry. And even smaller, I make oxidized, recycled, minimalist, sterling, silver, jewelry. You can see that I've really niched down over and over and over again to find that very specific micro niche that the majority of my stuff is. Like half of my shop is oxidized, minimalist, sterling, silver, jewelry, and the other half is not oxidized. So that didn't just happen overnight and it wasn't even a deliberate decision. It was something that evolved over time as I grew my business, as, as I tried lots of different things. I always did sterling silver jewelry. Well, actually that's a lie. I started off with beaded jewelry and segued into sterling silver jewelry within the first year. But basically I just kept following, you know, what people were buying, what people were commenting on, what was popular, what I enjoyed making. Uh, and over time that just sort of narrowed down into this little micro niche, which I love and has been really, really successful for me. And the same thing goes for lots of other people. You know, you become the person who's known for making a very specific type of thing. And that is when, you know, word of mouth starts happening and your brand starts to spread far and wide. So it's a really powerful way of making sure that you stand out from the crowd and from the competition. And don't feel that it's gonna constrain your creativity. One, you can always make other stuff that you don't sell. And two, I actually find having limits and constraints around my creativity incredibly powerful. You know, I actually make something like 50 something of my products from the exact same base material, a four inch length of one millimeter sterling silver wire. 
And I sit down and go, what else can I make with this same base material? And it's amazing what you can come up with when you have some sort of container around your creativity. It makes you think outside the box. It makes you dig a little deeper and try new things that you might have just glossed over beforehand. Number three, photos are everything. And this goes for whether you just sell online, even if you sell wholesale, even if you sell via market, you know, if you're getting the word out there about your products, it probably is online or via a flyer or some other visual medium. We are really visual creatures and the photo is the thing that's going to convince somebody to click or not click. If you don't have excellent photos, stop wasting your time on posting to Instagram or sending out email newsletters or writing better descriptions or trying to get better SEO. Focus on the photos, make them as good as they can possibly be and then work on that other stuff because the photo is the thing. It's the thing that the people will click on and it's the thing that will convince them to buy from you. I can't overstate how important this is. It is really, really vital. Uh, there are so many images coming at us now every day, you know, on our devices around us that we really need to make sure that ours are standing out from the crowd. If you need some help with this, I have an ebook called The Create and Thrive Guide to Product Photography, but wait, don't go and buy it yet. Wait till the end of the video because I'm going to give you a little tip about how you can get a bit of a discount in the not too distant future. So The Create and Thrive Guide to Product Photography was written by a professional photographer specifically for makers who are beginner or intermediate photographers. So that is there. It's not too expensive and it's very, very helpful. Uh, but you know, if you don't want to buy anything, that's cool. There's heaps of videos out there. There's heaps of uh, podcasts and blog posts out there that will help you, but really spend the time and invest the time in having great photos, either you learning how to take them or hiring somebody to do it for you. It will make a lot of difference and in fact oh maybe all of the difference between whether you succeed or not number four the thing i'd wish i'd known before i started is your never finished marketing ever 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 <laughs> it's something that's always evolving it's something you're always working on it's something that you can't neglect it's just has to become a system a habit something you do on a regular basis if you want your business to grow and succeed you have to just be willing to keep working on it, always. Uh, trying new things, uh, keeping up with the changes in technology, the changes in software, uh, the changes in customer and consumer behavior. All of these things have changed heaps since I started in 2008. You know, my business was built off the back of blogging and Twitter, and I barely do either of those at all anymore. I, my marketing has completely changed. So, you know, be aware of what's happening in the greater kind of marketplace of ideas and what's happening in the marketing sphere uh, because it will really help you to be successful if you're keeping on top of things and keeping consistent. You know, it's, it's not about doing something once and walking away from it. As in everything with business, it's about taking little steps every day um, making little actions every day, whether that's you know researching a new email marketing um, email service provider, whether that's you know spending a few minutes putting some things on Pinterest, whether it's using Instagram, whether it's working on your SEO, all of these things are little steps you can take every single day to improve your marketing um, savvy and also just to get your name out there because it's something you can never stop doing. I mean, think about the biggest companies in the world: Apple, Coke, McDonald's. How often do you see their ads around? A lot, right? You know, they still spend a lot of money and time on advertising them, even though they're everywhere, because advertising puts you in front of people's minds, like top of mind. People, if they see you over and over again, are more likely to buy from you. So marketing is ever evolving and never finished. Number five, the fifth thing I wish I'd known is how powerful SEO is. If you don't know what it is, it stands for search engine optimization. And it's basically working out how you can get more people to find what you make via search engines like Google or Etsy search. Honestly, the vast majority of my customers come in to my business via SEO. It has been the biggest game changer working out how that works, making sure you have the right keywords around your business, the right titles, the right tags, and if you're selling, you know, using Google, the right descriptions, 
because that is how people will find you. They will type into the search bar what they're looking for and you wanna make sure that you are the result that turns up. So invest your time in working out the right keywords that reflect the products you make. Uh, step away from fluffy words that don't describe what your, your products are. Put yourself in the mind of a customer and make sure that you are using those words. If you need some help with this, I have some workshops in my membership community, The Thriver Circle, but I also have a free workshop on this channel. Just search back. Uh, it's for Etsy search engine optimization or Etsy SEO. Uh, it's a huge long workshop that I actually did in cooperation with Etsy themselves. And I give you a whole bunch of really important tips about how to maximize your SEO over on Etsy. And a lot of those tips work for Google as well. So go check out that video after this one. Uh, if you haven't watched it already, you'll get heaps of really good tips. Okay, the sixth thing I wish I'd known before I started or when I was getting started is that I would spend so much of my time not actually making anything because I was spending like 80% of my time learning how to run a business because I had no idea. You're gonna find the same thing. You know, if you've been spending 100% of your, you know, crafty time making stuff and enjoying that, it will completely shift when you start a business and you'll find like 10 or 20% of the time you're making stuff and the rest of the time you are learning stuff and doing other stuff to do with your business. How many times can I say stuff in this one segment? Uh, so just be aware of that, that it's normal, that it's okay. In fact, it's necessary. You know, unless you're a business genius already and you run other businesses and you know all about marketing and photograph product photography and um, your ideal customer and branding and website development and social media, if you know how to do all that stuff already, you'll be fine. But if you don't, which is most of us, you're gonna need to spend a lot of time learning it. So just accept that for the first few years, you're gonna spend an awful lot of time not making when you're working on your business and that that is okay and normal. The seventh thing I wish I'd known is that energy and passion wax and wane. It's like a cycle, it's called, I call it the creative cycle. Don't think I coined that, but it's what I've been calling it for years now. And basically, you know, you'll have times when you're really super passionate and full of energy and really excited about your work and there'll be times where you're not and that's normal as well. And just being aware that that happens, I think, is important because if you know if it happens to you for the first time you might freak out this is what happened to me i freaked out and thought oh my god i've run out of ideas i'm my business is going to fail i'm never going to figure it out and I, I kind of had a bit of a panic thinking that i'd never get my inspiration back again and i did and it's happened many times over the last 12 years so if it happens to you just be aware that that's normal and it's okay and that chances are it will come back if you ever come to a point where it just never comes back, then that might be because there's a bigger yes out there and something else you want to do more. But stick with it. If you're having one of these creative lulls, just ride with it. Do the things you need to do. Give yourself a bit of downtime and chances are you'll find an upswing in that passion and energy again somewhere in the future. The eighth thing I wish I'd known is that you cannot compete on price. You are not a commodity. You're not oil or wheat or livestock or whatever those million and one commodities are out there you can't you know you have no market limit on your prices and you can't compete on price you are making something creative and unique and you need to charge what it's worth to you and then to your customer so you need to be doing your maths doing your pricing again i have workshops on this in my membership community the thriver circle link to that is in the description uh, I call it a two-part process. You price with the head, which is doing the maths. Then you price with the heart, which is doing the other stuff. That's where you look at the marketplace. You look at where you want to position yourself in that marketplace, where your brand sits, uh, what you feel is a you know the right price to charge for this thing. Because you might find the maths comes out at you know thirty dollars, but you can afford to charge fifty because you want to position yourself as top of the marketplace or in the top of the marketplace and that's absolutely fine. Like think of the companies out in the world, uh, you can go to, to Kmart or Target and buy a dress for $20 or even less. Or you can go to, I don't know, Burberry and buy one for a couple of thousand dollars. Is there really much difference? They're probably both made in the same Chinese factory by the same people. It's nothing to do with the materials. It's nothing to do with the time that goes into it. This is what everybody gets stuck on when they're doing their pricing. You know, oh, my materials, as long as you cover, your materials, your time, your overhead, etc. 
the rest of the pricing comes down to other factors, emotional factors. And you cannot price yourself to compete and be the bottom of the marketplace. If you go out and look at people making similar stuff to you, you'll find people much cheaper and probably people much more expensive than you. And that's fine and that's normal. Don't try to compete on price by dropping your price because it does not make for a sustainable business. And even more so, man, if we all do it, we all lose. So if we're all, you know, do the maths, stick to our guns and have higher prices, then the customers will start to learn that that's the real value of the work that they're buying. So don't underprice yourself. Remember, you're not a commodity, you're a brand. The ninth thing I wish I'd known when I started is that when you turn your hobby into a business, you need to find a new hobby. Seriously, your relationship with your craft will completely change when you stop just making it for yourself and you start making it for other people. And you, it won't necessarily be the escape and the relaxation that it was it will turn into a job and that's not necessarily a bad thing because don't we all want a job that we love doing but just be aware that you're probably going to want to find something new to do that has nothing to do with your business that you can just do for enjoyment whether it's another craft or another activity altogether and know that that's going to happen and that your that relationship change with your craft is normal and natural and if you're afraid of that maybe starting a business is not actually the right thing to do with this particular craft because you might just want to keep it to yourself and for yourself. And the 10th thing I wish I'd known from the beginning is how important your story is and how important it is to share it with your customers. So you want to be a real human being. This is the power of handmade. This is the power of having this sort of business. You're a real person talking to a real person. Your, you know, your power, your emotional connection is your power. It's, it's a superpower here. It's something that big corporations, even though they try to have it, don't really have. Because at the end of the day, you're the maker and the communicator, especially if you're a one person show. This was a game changer in my business. So I read a book uh, many years ago by Bernadette Jiwa. I think it was the fortune cookie principle. And she talked about how important your story is. Um, it could have been one of her other books. I've read a couple. But it's this idea of being really open and honest and even vulnerable and, and opening your heart to your customers. And this sounds a bit woo, but let me give you a concrete example of what I'm talking about. So whenever I make a jewelry sale, I send each customer a manual email, a thank you email, which used to be one paragraph saying, thanks for your order. Um, it'll be, you know, we'll make it within the next seven days. It'll take you, it'll take this long to ship to you. If you have any questions, let me know. Thanks, Jess. Okay. Now that's still a step above and beyond what a lot of people do, which is they don't even do that. They just let the automatic stuff do it. But I feel like, you know, I don't get hundreds of orders a day. I might get a couple of orders a day and I can afford to spend the time to do this. Why? Because it is an incredibly powerful way to connect with your customer and build a relationship with them. Now I send a message that's about five or six paragraphs long. And I talk about how grateful I am that you know, they've chosen to support my little family business, uh, that out of all the things they could have bought in the world, the billions of things, they chose something that I've created, that they're supporting my husband, my kitty cats, that we're gonna make their thing with love, specifically for them in our solar power home studio in Queensland, Australia. Um, we talk about that, it, you know, in the next one to two weeks, we're gonna sit down and make it and then we'll wrap it up like a gift and send it to you and the shipping will take you know, depending on where you are, I always say, you know, two to four weeks or whatever. And then I have a paragraph about, you know, it, one, talking to you is one of my favorite things about being an artisan. If you need to talk to me, any questions, no worries. I'll get back to you within 24 hours, excluding weekends. And then I have a little sign off and then I have a PS that tells them how they can get 10% off their next order by joining my mailing list. Now you might notice there, there was actually a lot of real factual information interwoven into the story that I told. I told them how long it's going to take, where I am for starters, because sometimes they don't notice that, where I am, how long it's going to take the thing to get made. I told them uh, it's coming gift wrapped already. I told them how long it's going to take to ship to them. I communicated to them what they can expect when it comes to my communication with them, i.e. don't expect me to get back to you in, a, in an hour, expect it within 24 hours and I don't work on weekends. So I'm actually weaving a lot of really factual, useful information that they might have glazed over if I just sent it boom, boom, boom. But by weaving it into an emotional story, I've actually captured their attention 
and I've made that emotional connection. Why is that powerful? For a couple of reasons. One, it's really powerful because word of mouth is still one of the most powerful marketing strategies out there. And if you can, you know, give people a really amazing experience, they're way more likely to tell their friends and then their friends are more likely to come and shop with you. But number two, building that relationship, not only is just, let's, let's put aside the fact it's just really lovely and it's a really enjoyable part of having a handmade business. If something goes wrong, then you're way in a way better position to sort things out with your customer. So, you know, uh, if I've already created that emotional connection, oftentimes my customers will email me straight back and go, oh, that's so lovely. You know, I'm so happy to be supporting your family business. I love that it's coming from Australia. I love that you, you know, they tell me what they like about it. They tell me that they love that we work in a solar powered from a solar powered studio or that, um, you know, they love that our jewelry is recycled. So. I actually get feedback as well, but if something was to go wrong, like if something was to go missing or some other problem, it's way more likely that, that customer who's already talked to me in a positive way is just gonna message me and go, hey Jess, there's a problem, how can we fix it? Rather than opening a case with Etsy or PayPal or sending me an angry email. So it's a really, really, really powerful way of setting up that great positive emotional uh, connection with your customers, which will pay off big time in the long run. So if you're not already doing it, I strongly recommend you do that. And that's it. That uh, Those are 10 and there's so many more, <laughs> but those are 10 things I wish I had known before I started my own handmade business that I hope will help you with your own handmade business journey. Now I mentioned earlier in the video, uh, when I was talking about the Create and Thrive Guide to Product Photography to just wait, this is that moment. I'm celebrating 10 years of self-employment this month and very soon I'm gonna be running a really special 10 days of deals promotion where I'm gonna be sending out a special every day and basically everything I create uh, is gonna be on special in some way. So if you wanna get access to that, the link is in the description below. Go sign up for the 10 days of deals and uh, you will find yourself getting a good deal on that Create and Thrive Guide to Product Photography if you get yourself in there. Now, if uh, you're watching this after January 2020, I'm sorry you've missed out, but hey, maybe I'll do another one for my 20th anniversary of being self-employed, who knows? In any case, thank you so much for being here and watching this video. Uh, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future videos and I'll be back again in a fortnight with another video all about how to take your handmade hobby and turn it into a thriving, profitable business. Bye for now.